Hello comrades, and welcome to another video on the Russian Revolution area of study one. In this video, we will be looking at the years of the Duma up to World War One. The Duma did continue into World War One in some form or another, but um, we're just moving, uh, looking at it up to the beginning of the war. Um, so that covers the period of 1906 to 1914. In terms of the key knowledge uh, that this video will outline, either directly or indirectly, um, we'll look at some of the events and conditions that contributed to the outbreak of revolution, including, I should have uh, um, bolded this, the October Manifesto, which we talked about last time, the Fundamental Laws, which was the constitution or the new constitution of Russia, um, and the limitations of the Dumas. Uh, we'll also look at ideas that played a significant role in challenging the existing order, including discontent with czarist autocracy and liberal ideas and reforms. Um, we'll look at the role of two individuals in challenging or maintaining the power of the existing order. Both of these individuals aim to maintain the power of the existing order, those being Tsar Nicholas II and Pyotr Stolypin. Um, and we'll look at the contribution of popular movements in mobilizing society and challenging the existing order, uh, including the role of political parties, socialist revolutionaries, Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, Octoberists and cadets. So let's get into it. First off, uh, where we left off. So the October Manifesto, drafted by Sergei Witt, promised civil liberties and the establishment of an elected parliament known as the Duma. Um, the October Manifesto was passed um, uh, due to the revolutionary years of 1904 to 1905 that led to the 1905 revolution. Um, all state laws were to pass through and be approved by the Duma. And Tsar Nicholas begrudgingly agreed to these reforms um, out of necessity so as to prevent further revolutionary action. Um, here is an image of the opening ceremony of the first state Duma in 1906. You can see Tsar Nicholas down there with Tsarina Alexandra there. Um, and I mean, you, we'll find out about the first Duma, but you can see that it's not necessarily representative of the vast majority of Russians. Um, it's clearly made up of members of the um, bourgeoisie, uh, members of the nobility, um, so not very representative at all. So let's start by looking at the electoral laws. So the electoral laws were drafted in December 1905. Um, they allowed only male landowners over the age of 25 with estates of more than 200 hectares to vote directly for their representatives. So think about that. We've got 82% of the population are peasants. Another 4% or more are industrial workers. So that's 86% that cannot directly vote for their representatives. And out of the remainder, um, there are so many in the middle classes that don't have estates of more than 200 hectares or are female or are under the age of 25. So this already, these electoral laws do not... Um, uh, suggests a movement to um, universal suffrage as uh, the liberals um, had intended and wanted. Um, peasants only had an indirect vote whereby they could elect someone who fit into this category. Generally speaking, it was landowners that they could elect um, to vote on their behalf. So peasants could vote for um, a landowner that they maybe farmed the land of, um, and then that landowner could vote for whoever they wanted to. Um, other social groups, over 60% of the urban working population were completely excluded from voting, uh, including factory workers from businesses that employed less than 50 employees, which was the majority of factories, uh, construction workers, and casual tradesmen. Uh, soldiers and women were also not allowed to vote. So the electoral laws were not very, did not allow for great representation. Uh, the resignation of Witt and the rise of Pyotr Stolypin. So following the October Manifesto, Sergei Witt was appointed acting prime minister. But Nicholas grew to resent Witt for compelling him to make reforms he felt were unnecessary. Nicholas is quoted as saying, curse the Duma, it's all Witt's fault. 
So after his father, Alexander III, had um, implored um, Nicholas to listen to Wit, uh, now Nicholas resented Wit for the advice that Wit had given him um, that really managed to prevent a revolution at the end of 1905, um, or at least to prevent the downfall of the Tsar. Uh, Witt resigned as Prime Minister on the 22nd of April 1906, just before the opening of the First Duma. At the same time, Pyotr Stolypin was chosen to stem the tide of revolution and to strengthen the autocracy. In April 1906, he was appointed Minister of the Interior, and in July of the same year, he was promoted to Prime Minister. Uh, in addressing the challenges faced by the Tsarist regime, Stolypin said his guiding principles were suppression of revolution first, and then, and only then, reform. Suppression and reform. But re suppression has to come first, and once you've suppressed all of the revolutionary activities taking place in Russia, um, then you can implement some very light reforms. The fundamental laws. So the fundamental laws are a key knowledge point in the study design, and the fundamental laws are Russia's first constitution of 1906. Here's a quote from the Tsar. He said, I created the Duma not to be directed by it, but to be advised. So if we remember from the October Manifesto, all state laws are meant to go through the Duma. That means to an extent that the Tsar has to be directed by the Duma because the Tsar can't just do anything um, without the Duma's consent. Um, however, the Tsar is now flipping it and saying that he's he didn't create the Duma to be directed by it, but to be advised and for him to have the final say. So on the 23rd of April 1906, Tsar Nicholas issued the Fundamental Laws, which outlined how Russia's new political system would function. Uh, the fundamental laws proclaimed that the Tsar would appoint his own ministers who were accountable to him and not to the Duma. The Tsar retained complete control over foreign affairs, military matters, and the declaration of states of emergency. So he didn't have to ask the Duma anything with regard to those matters. And he still had supreme power. All laws would require his approval. That is the polar opposite of the promise made in the October Manifesto that all laws would have to pass through the Duma. Now, all laws have to pass through the Tsar. So on top of that, Article 87 of the Constitution of the Fundamental Laws stated that under, quote, exceptional circumstances, the Tsar could dismiss the Duma whenever he liked and legislate on his own i.e. legislate, make laws without um, the approval of the Duma or even the advice of a parliamentary um, uh, body like the Duma. So let's have a look at the four different Dumas that were, that, that, um, were around during Tsar Nicholas's um, reign. The first Duma lasted from April to June 1906. Oh, that's not a very long time. Maybe the Tsar needed to um, dissolve the Duma for exceptional circumstances. Um, so the Socialist Revolutionaries and Social Democratic Labour Parties, the SRs and the SDs, boycotted elections for the first Duma, rejecting, quote, the very principles of constitutional monarchy and parliamentary government. Um, the first Duma opened on the 27th of April 1906, so just a few days after Witt's resignation, um, and key results included 37% cadets. Um, the cadets were a progressive liberal party that advocated for further reforms, including protections for civil rights and more representative government. Uh, you'll remember the cadets from um, a previous video. Uh, they... Um, were established in October 1905, um, and they wanted to um, they wanted to push the Tsar to make further reforms. Um, Twenty percent Trudoviks, and um, they were a breakaway faction of the SRs, which was a radical socialist party that believed peasants and workers were the key revolutionary classes. So this faction of the SRs broke away from the main socialist revolutionaries because they wanted to make some changes through this parliamentary process. 
Um, the first Duma issued 391 statements criticizing the actions of the Tsar or the government and was dissolved by Tsar Nicholas after only 73 days. Uh, the Tsar ruled without a parliament um, from June 1906 to February 1907. Now, um, I just ha uh, had a thought that a lot happened in just the space of five days. The fundamental laws, um, uh, sorry, the, the resignation of wit happens on the 22nd of October. The fundamental laws are issued on the 23rd of October, sorry, the 22nd of April, 1906. The fundamental laws are issued on the 23rd of April, 1906. I wonder if there's a connection there when wit was the one who drafted the October manifesto. And now the fundamental laws is flipping a lot of that and taking back some of those promises. Uh, and then the first Duma opens on the 27th of April, only lasting 73 days. Um, the second Duma lasted from February to June, 1907. Again, not a very long time. Um, the SDs and the SRs decided to end their boycott and participate in the elections for the second Duma. The second Duma was actually more radical than the first for this very reason. Um, it became impossible for the for the Tsar and the new Prime Minister Stolypin to work with this Duma, who refused to support Stolypin's proposed land reforms, which we'll talk about very shortly. Uh, in early June 1907, the SDs were accused of plotting to overthrow the Tsarist regime, so Menshevik and Bolshevik deputies had their parliamentary privileges suspended. Um, the Duma was dissolved on the 3rd of June 1906, so just a matter of a couple of days after this accusation, and on the same day, Stolypin brought in sweeping changes to the electoral system and voting was suspended in districts where, according to Tsar Nicholas, the population, quote, had not yet reached sufficient levels of civic development. By that, he means all the places that are voting for these left-wing parties, we are going to restrict their um, access to vote. Um because they are not at sufficient levels of civic development. So you can see the results of the Second Duma. The Trudeviks, the breakaway of the SRs, um, were the most popular with 104 seats. The Cadets, who were the progressive liberals with 98 seats. I don't know who the autonomists are. Um, the SDs came forth with 65 seats. Um, independence they could be they could be anyone they could be left wing right wing it's hard to say uh and socialist revolutionary parties um sixth with 37 seats um compared to the moderates and octoberists who were supportive of the czar only had 32 seats and minor conservative parties with 22 so 54 seats not to mention the other and the independents who we don't know about um were um loyal to the czar whereas over 100, 200, three, yeah, about 300 seats were not loyal to the Tsar and challenged the Tsar at every opportunity. So the second Duma was dissolved. The third Duma, November 1907 to June 1912. So this, um, as a result of Stolypin's new voting laws, the Tsar and Prime Minister achieved a much more conservative and compliant Duma. According to Stolypin, this Duma was composed of, quote, responsible and statesmanlike people. Um, the third Duma was elected in November 1907 and was permitted to serve its full five-year term, with the Octoberists, those conservative liberals who were supportive of the Tsar, um, the most popular party with 154 seats, uh, the Trudeviks only receiving uh, 13 seats, um, the uh, SDs only receiving 19 seats. Um, so the third Duma was the first to serve its full term. The fourth Duma, um, it says here from November 1912 to August uh, 1914, but actually the fourth Duma was in and out during the world, during World War I. Uh, the term of the fourth Duma was plagued by mounting tensions and an increase in protests by industrial workers. Uh, this increase in protests was spurred on by the 12th of April 1912 uh, Lena Goldfields massacre in Siberia, in which 500 miners that who were on strike for better pay and conditions were shot by government forces, which drew comparisons to Bloody Sunday. Uh, Prime Minister Stolypin was assassinated by revolutionaries in September 1911. 
And although the fourth Duma was arguably the most conservative of the Dumas, the relationship between the parliament and the government was strained, uh, and Duma deputies became increasingly critical of the government, which we will see during um, our next few videos on World War One, the period of World War One up to the February Revolution. So P Piotr Stolopin, um, Reaction and Reform. Solopin was considered one of the last great statesmen of Russia's Tsarist era. As prime minister, he declared martial law, i.e. Um, the military, um, giving the military much more power to, um, to facilitate justice and punishment um, in an attempt to brutally crush the aftermath of the 1905 revolution. Between 1906 and 1913, an estimated 3,000 people were executed for terrorist and revolutionary activities, um, so much so that the hangman's noose became known as the Stolypin necktie. Um, Stolypin introduced sweeping agrarian land reforms, giving peasants the opportunity to own private land. Now, that sounds great. The peasants make up a huge proportion of the population. Um, so surely um, giving them the opportunity to own private land um, is going to increase their loyalty to the Tsar. Well, that was exactly Stolypin's intention. He hoped to create a class of self-sufficient and prosperous peasants who would be more likely to obey and remain loyal to the government. However, Stolypin was assassinated by S.R. Dmitry Bogrov. I told you it would always be S.R.'s assassinating um, long before his agrarian reforms had time to show results. So he made these, this promise to the peasants that they would have the opportunity to own private land. And then he died before those promises could be followed through on. Um, so that brings us to the end of this video. However, let's do a quick summary of the causes of the revolution so far. Uh, remembering that area of study one is all about causes of the Russian Revolution. So firstly, Tsar Nicholas was a weak and unprepared ruler. I am not prepared to be Tsar. I never wanted to be one. I don't think that's the exact quote, but it's close enough. Um, Sergei Witt's rapid industrialization, the Great Spurt, led to, quote, urbanization, internal migration, and the emergence of new social classes, which set in train forces that serve to erode the foundations of the autocratic state. Um, so all of that in internal migration and the emergence of new classes um, increased people's revolutionary attitudes. Uh, number three, the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905 humiliated and angered Russian people. Number four, Bloody Sunday and increased industrial action brought about the 1905 revolution and the um, subsequent October Manifesto. Uh, number five, the Duma was created, but the fundamental laws limited their power going against what the October Manifesto had promised. Um the first two lasted less than four months each, and Stolypin's changes to the electoral laws made the Duma more compliant and conservative and showed to revolutionaries and liberals alike that the Tsar was not serious about making reform reforms. Um, and finally, Stolypin was assassinated in September 1911, and the Lena Goldfields incident or massacre of 1912 rekindled the radical workers' movement. So a revolution is buzzing in Russia. All that is needed is a big event like a world war uh, and some terrible decisions by um, the Tsar uh, to unleash a revolution in Russia. Our next video will be on World War One, and um, we're going to do it. There will be a couple other videos after that leading to the February Revolution. I hope you found this video interesting and useful, and I will see you next time.